somewhere in our northern hills, facing our beautiful Caribbean sea, an European citizen once knocked a glass of splendid Argentine wine and robustly declared, man, I love Trinidad. His accent was the impressive Trinidadanese, having lived in our gorgeous isle for many years. If you were fortunate to frequent his rustic cabanas, you would appreciate his sworn love for us. His full surrender to our local cuisine, the delightful home comforts, the unreserved friendliness that if ever denied would become a high court issue granted. All these characteristics neatly wrapped up in that northern environment. But he confessed, I must return to my homeland every year. If I never leave Trinidad, I would die laughing. I believe he found our politics agonizingly hilarious. Still, he was captivated by our people's simple charm, unique cosmopolitan heritage, and good looks. And the nicknames he mused, what an ingenious gift Trinidadians have for slapping on nicknames. I call this country Nickname Paradise. Indeed, we are casual experts at promptly labeling man, woman, child, dog, even a building at a glance or upon hearsay. Our Prime Minister was recently labelled with a nickname that he found oppressive or objectionable, distasteful, but our opposition leader too has had her share of funny names. Why even the United States President has been called Sleepy Eye Joe? And British politics offer multiple caricatures and outlandish nicknames. So we are not exempted from these nicknames, but we are unique when it comes to nicknames in Trinidad. Let's get back to our local local scene. Take Wing for instance. I never knew how this slow moving character came by such an undeserving handle. And this long before KFC, churches, Japs, hot wings and Popeyes appeared. Every day just after the lunch hour, Wing walked to Cora Road past our home. I was very young then, but I vividly remember when our dog, Jack the Ripper, bit off a chunk of Wing's right calf. My goodness. What blood, what pain, what an embarrassment for our family. What a nuisance for my dad, who finally flew into a fit and told Wing, who finally flew into a fit and told Wing he couldn't continue the weekly cash compensations. Poor Wing. No recourse to exorbitant lawyers, no dog act insurance to back about, no police intervention in a matter nullified with Dad's first consolation payment. Poor Wing. How he must have longed for the wings of a dove or those of a chicken hawk. They were frequent in Cora, you know. Meanwhile, Jack the Ripper unleashed, tackled the map of pea, and staggered into the bushes to die, not in the least repentant over Wing's hobbling gait. Then there was the dragon. Oh my, I feared him. How he got this fearsome name, I am yet to discover. But his wanderings in the valley struck fear in my heart, as it did in all of neighbors around. From behind a mango tree, I once spied this fiend, cutlass in sheath sharper than a menorah shaven blade. Menorah were popular back in our days, barefoot on the hot pitch, but dragons are comfortable in heat. Left eye devilishly, devilishly shut tight, teeth in desperate need of some dental care, patched shorts and bareback. I never knew if he was married, but then who would engage a, ma a dragon? A female dragon, of course but I didn't see any in Cora when I was a boy. The dragon had a habit too of pulling fiercely on those filterless anchor cigarettes, one after the other. He must have smoked about three packs a day. This made his nostrils flare peculiarly. Face to face with the dragon one day, he turned out to be one of the most pleasant memories I have as a child growing up in the Cora Valley. No fire and brimstone just an uneducated but truly funny individual. Somehow I suspected he was growing rather fond of mother's fine cooking. The dragon learned how to time those meals. 
and with each encounter my suspicion of mischief receded. Ah, Badis Maharaj, Badis. Someone, the joke went, asked the time and Badis palmed a pair of guns, were they toy guns? And chillingly declared 245. I think Kip Roxburgh once in a, in a book called Crisis that uh, was put out by Imprint, he spoke of the time when Badis Maharaj, founder of the Mahasabha, he was gambling in Kirap there. It was a rainy night and Badis was sure he had the bet under control. And Badis sent his son to Chanfleur to get some extra money because the bet was halted then, I think. And uh, Kit wrote that uh, on the way back, Badis' son, driving a Jaguar car, struck a tree that is at the the right in St. Joseph there, you, you, you probably know it. it, it runs there along the main road and the road diverts like a Y going up east and then heading up into the St. Joseph Hill and that tree I believe was the tree on which Badis' son died and Badis lost the bet. Anyway, Badis was the man who said 245. That joker's version became legendary. It seemed everyone's timepiece was stuck on that hour. One day, years later, my Casio malfunctioned and it too halted at the infamous hour. How I laughed again. Next came Scarlet, the Scarlet Pimpernel. You seek him here, you seek him there, that infernal Scarlet Pimpernel. That elusive British aristocrat who crossed the English Channel to rescue the innocent from the French guillotine. Master of disguise, brilliant swordsman, romantic hero. Well, we too had our Scarlet Pimpernel. Under cover of darkness, many a plump chicken disappeared from flimsy coops, turning up in a coral riverside pot, expertly curried and served with steaming white rice, shared in bamboo joints. I know, I was a teenage stranger to Scarlet's campfires, and his incessant tears of midnight chicken horns really caught me, finally, I met the Scarlet Pimpernel, and I loved his cooking. The story of Big Belly, Broad Mouth and Tin Foot is perhaps more applicable today, both in attitude and physical awareness, and there are golden morals in each case. You might not know the tale, but there was a huge pawpaw tree laden with the lush yellow gems just waiting to be plucked. So our local Big Belly was not big then. But he was the only climber in the group, so up he went. How greedy he was, he munched away until his belly burst, the yellow lava gushing out. Quite an old story, actually, about Big Belly. I think in the original story, it was that he went up the mango tree or the cashew tree, but it was the same result that whatever content he had in his tummy, out it came when when his belly got ripped on some some protruding part of the tree. Good for you, said the mouth, and laughed and laughed until his cheeks split. Foot took off, but his right ankle snapped in an ant's hole, and he crawled home to Mama. The moral, don't be greedy, don't laugh at tragedy, and avoid the ant's hole if you have ten feet. But I've got to tell you too about Frog. You know, this man was called Frog. And I thought that was an unkind nickname until one day he got into the truck with me and we were going point and we were talking and he said, yeah, man, if you ask anybody in point for me, they call me frog. And I looked at him for the first time. I scrutinized him and I said, what a nickname that suits somebody. And then there was Dr. Rat. Can you imagine a nickname like Dr. Rat? But if you had known the character, I believe he lived somewhere on Observatory Street, Port of Spain, and he was, I don't know how he died, I can't remember, but Dr. Rat had the, it was an (laughs) appropriate nickname for a man. Then there's Mouse, Manicou, Dogface, Pitch Lake, Donkey, Elephant Walk. Elephant Walk was supposed to be a proprietor of a, a nightclub in Port of Spain. He was a big man, I think. I might have seen him once or twice. I don't remember if he walked like an elephant, but he got the name Elephant Walk. 
whether it was from a movie or what. Kiss Kiddy. Then you have Kissinger. Kissinger would be like people who, you know, like to kiss a lot. They like to kiss. Whether old or young, they like to kiss. They greet you, they kiss. Now with COVID, it might be a difficult thing to be called a Kissinger. It might not be so safe after all. Then there's Cashew Head. Cashew Head. How does someone end up like a Cashew Head? I can't say. Then you have Copper Head. You have Pin Head. You have Big Eye. You have Puxi. You have White Man. You have Zorro. You have El Toro. Betsy Prim Prim. You have Goose. Russia. Ah, Russia. Russia was the official president of the unofficial Beggars Association back in the 60s. And he would group a lot of people around him. He would declare things like, you know, uh, today we are going down to the X. And everybody would say, press, because we have a complaint. And that was Russia for you. And I don't know, he was an Indian man, and I don't know how he got the name Russia. Then we have horse, golden tongues, limpy alligator, big head, ballast. He did have a big head. Boom, doom, half a bub. Bull man, bad man, whitey king kid. That name was adopted from the Western movie called uh, Ride Clay of Diablo with Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy was uh, the, the only soldier, I think, in the US Army who was the most decorated soldier of all time. Then he went into movie making. He made several movies, but he's best remembered in Western movies. Spider-Man. I've included Spider-Man here because I know Earl Carter, a national Trinidad national footballer, and um, he was a goalkeeper, and he was extremely um, adept at snatching the ball, as they would say, right out of the V when it was struck. He was he was good at that. He was good at that Earl Carter. And he, he earned the name uh, Spider-Man. He featured often on the back pages of the, the Express. I have no idea where he is today. I don't know what web he's on. You had Bling Bling, and then we have Apache and somebody called CNN, who knows everything going on in almost every district. In Trinidad. We have one one that's a two teeth only mechanic from Point Fourteen. He is dead and gone, but I remember him fondly at, at a National Petroleum. He was a quite a friendly man and he had just two teeth to the front. And you would say, um, Archie, how are you doing today? And you say, one one, one one. <laughs> then we had the Fura. And that's the former tough editor of the Express, the Führer. When he called you and he asked you for your copy, and he, he, he asked you to see him in the office, you felt, boy, I'm going to get the firing squad, the Führer. And of course, we have Mummers, that pudgy Irish priest who fell asleep with his congregation most Sunday mornings. Cora Junction also had its cool characters, but the one who stands out most is Mr. Ranchbeni. An Orange Grove employee, he was addicted to the British culture. Friday evenings found him standing opposite to Mr. Isaac's parlor on what was then a small savannah <clears throat> that now houses Cost Cutters Supermarket. Yes, where Cost Cutters stands in Cora Junction, there was a small savannah. And the boys usually from the village would play football and inadvertently the ball ended up in the temple yard and it was always a struggle to get it back because the people there they felt you all are disrespecting the thing but it always came back to them it always came back to them so a few people would know that where course cutters car park and the supermarket stands was once a small savannah and that, that's interesting Mr. Raj Beniz, um was fully charged every Friday, you could say, and he would launch into a formal oration that only he understood. Really true. He had the antics to go with it, and he would talk, you know, in his, in his, in his, in his own inimical style there. And he, he was very entertaining. 
Nobody took him on actually. Nobody took him on. But I used to stand as a little fellow, you know, opposite there and, and watch this man talking. And I, I, I'm thinking, you know, he he would have done good as, as, as Gandhi. He would have made a good replacement for Gandhi. He, he really was quite a character. And how I loved his, um, his bowler hat. I've tried to, um, to borrow something that looks like Mr. Rajbani's hat. It would fit him like this, you know. And um, he would wear it. He, he, he never stood. He never stood on that spot without his bowler hat. Perhaps he got it from, from an Englishman representing Kate and Lyle, the sugar magnates. Kate and Lyle operated uh, the sugar estates here in Trinidad. And they were, they were um, prominent here in Orange Grove. One thing more, Mr. Rajvani never uttered a fall word in his weekly speeches. I really appreciated this humble man. And he's gone on long years. Well, I hope you enjoyed a little discourse about Trinidad and some of the old time things. And do have a good weekend.